right. Thank you, Pradeep. Good evening, everyone. Um, I'm uh, very happy to introduce and host our speaker, uh, a Comsoc uh, distinguished lecturer, Dr. Melike um, Erol Kantashi. Um, she is the chief um, cloud ran AI ML data scientist at Ericsson and Canada chair, Canada research chair uh, in AI enabled uh, next generation wireless networks and associate professor at the School of Electrical Engineering and Computer Science at the University of Ottawa. Uh, she's the founding uh, director of uh, Netco Laboratory. Uh, she is also a faculty affiliate uh, at the Vector Institute uh, in Toronto. Uh, she has over 150 peer reviewed publications uh, with uh, have been uh, which uh, you know have been cited uh, six thousand uh, times, uh, Google Scholar, and has a H index of forty. Um, and she has received numerous awards and recognitions. Recently, she uh, received the twenty twenty uh, Distinguished Service Award of the IEEE uh, Communication Society Technical Committee on Green Communications and Computing. And she was also named as the N Square Woman Stars in uh, Computer Networking and Communications in 2019. Um, uh, uh, she also has delivered over 70 keynotes, tutorials, and panels around the globe and has acted as the general chair and the technical program chair for many international conferences and workshops. Uh, her main research interests are in the area of AI-enabled wireless networks, 5G, 6G wireless communications, and smart grids and IoT. Uh, she's a uh, IEEE Comsoc Distinguished Lecturer and a senior member uh, in both IEEE and ACM. So um, Mel uh, um, accepted that you know the audience can ask questions uh, in the middle. So you can unmute the uh, unmute and ask questions directly, or if you want to type, that's okay. Also, I can uh, help um, uh, ask that question on behalf of you. Uh, if too many questions comes, we will control. Uh, we may have to raise the hands and so on. Let's see how things goes, but you know, feel free to ask questions. So without any further ado, uh, let's welcome our speaker to talk about uh, reinforcement learning and uh, deep reinforcement learning in 5G and the 6G networks. Okay. Well, thank you very much for this uh, nice introduction. Uh, and I would like to thank very much to the uh, hosting uh, chapters of this talk, uh, Oregon chapter, Santa Clara Valley chapter, Seattle, Foothills, San Fernando Valley. Um, it's a great pleasure uh, to be uh, giving this seminar uh, to so many people. And uh, thanks everyone for uh, being available at this time. I would say uh, for some of you, probably that's quite an early morning time. So good morning to you. Uh, for those of you who, who are you know, in the maybe uh, Pacific time zone, good evening. And uh, my time zone in Ottawa uh, is as well late evening. Uh, so uh, I call this talk, or I uh, gave the title to this talk as Deep and Reinforcement Learning in 5G and 6G. Uh, but this is uh, more of a placeholder for all the machine learning work that we do in my lab, NetCore. Uh, and there's nothing that is called like deep and reinforcement learning. <laughs> there's reinforcement learning, there's deep learning and deep reinforcement learning. Uh, but that was a short way of writing everything in, in just one title. And today I will talk about uh, also a different, in addition to these, uh, a very recently developed technique by my group uh, and applied to 5G networks, transfer reinforcement learning uh, techniques. So let's see how it goes. Uh, and I will first begin with um, our, uh, you know, as a society, our needs of uh, connectivity. And although the pandemic is winding down and we are getting back to the office slowly in some countries, I guess it has been a fast change. Uh, but the past two years uh, for many of us has been the time for work from home. 
and despite all the <laughs> challenges, one thing that kept us up was the ability to remote work. And this was facilitated by connectivity. And well, maybe you would remember, well, it's, it's almost a year now, but it looks like it was quite uh, dated. Um, at one time, we heard people or we were also dreaming of workations. So going to a rural place, going to a cottage, working from uh, maybe a lakeside or a seaside, and also uh, rural communities, their connectivity, their uh, access to um, basically remotely being able to function, we started questioning these because as we started going into rural and remote areas, the level of connectivity or the quality of service in those areas started dropping sharply than the, you know, our usual urban areas. And suddenly we realized even more. And to add to this picture, as humans, we become a lot dependent to connectivity, that's for sure. But these days, machines also want to talk to their machine friends or peers. Um, so we talk about smart factories uh, or smart uh, manufacturing, smart production, uh, where we have uh, very delay sensitive or low latency and high reliability communication needs uh, in, in real settings. So uh, with these needs, uh, 5G was born uh, and releases, especially 3G re releases uh, 15, 16, 17 has uh, come along and 17 is coming along. Uh, we have been trying to, uh, we have been improving LTE. Uh, and you know, with the self-driving cars, with all those uh, things that I showed in the previous slide, we all noticed like, connectivity is needed, low latency connectivity is needed, the demand is increasing. So at one point, LT is not enough, so we have to have the 5G. And now we are getting into the era where we are seeing more types of killer applications, or maybe more than seeing, we are envisioning uh, more uh, different type of killer applications, which will be the drivers of 6G. So already 3GPP is uh, working on the standardization of 5G beyond or 5G advanced, and the future will be 6G. Now with 6G, what are the important technologies? I could have filled up this slide with a lot of bullets talking about what would 6G be about, but instead I selected or cherry picked only a couple of them, which I think are very important. So for sure, 6G will serve more diverse set of users and verticals, and this is what? has been driving 4G, this is what has been driving 5G, and it will be the same for 6G. But from the technical perspective, how can we improve systems and especially quite highly optimized systems we are talking about? So we see two important trends here, use of semantics and being AI native. So semantics is um, corresponds to the context of the communication is happening. So more than considering bits, number of bits that are being transmitted, are we actually transmitting the important information, the information as understood by the receiver and receiver being a human or a machine. So it's not like the antenna receiver, but the actual receptor of the information. So can we uh, make use of semantic to improve uh, the delivery of information? And then AI comes as an important fact. And this is actually, this has some history. Um, and I can say it all started with uh, SON, self-organized networks in LT. And some, of course, I mean, there are some predecessors to that one as well. Uh, but in the standards, we see SON. Uh, and with SON, we started seeing uh, how important automation is. With automation, removing human from the loop or assisting humans. So I don't want to say removing humans because it doesn't really <laughs> uh, sound uh, quite well. And uh, it is probably not the intention in the, uh, in the very uh, short term, uh, but saving from workforce, uh, saving from OPEX for the operators by reducing the operational costs of networks, use of network automation, and 
one step further uh, use of AI. So AI or artificial intelligence as an umbrella and machine learning as the name of the techniques that appears in this, uh, under this umbrella, uh, we apply it in many places. Now, if we talk about how artificial intelligence uh, developed, actually, uh, you know, the history goes back uh, quite, quite a long way. And I don't want to spend, you know, the entire time important figures uh, coming from um, coming from the control theory background uh, implications on uh, credit assignment problems around 1960s that, that that were studied at the time and then emergence of expert systems with the belief that if we were able to uh, teach machines all the rules around us, the machines would be as smart as humans, which then suddenly uh, showed that it was not the way to go. Uh, and uh, luckily at that time, some people argued that we are missing the adaptive uh, nature of learning. And that's, you know, slowly came to the birth of uh, reinforcement learning. And today's talk is more about reinforcement learning and reinforcement learning mimics the interactive learning in humans. So as humans or animals too, like think of a cat or a dog, um, we are not born with rules of the world around us. We try, we experiment, we sometimes make mistakes, like you climb a tree, you fall, and then you either never climb a tree or you learn how to <laughs> climb a tree. Uh, so with experimenting, uh, trial and error, basically, we learn things. And the fundamentals of reinforcement learning is actually trial and error. But it's not just one time trial and error. It's many episodes of trial and error. And here the important thing is if you consider a human or a cat or a dog as an agent, uh, that agent interacts with the environment, takes an action. The state of the environment changes and a reward is given to the agent for the behavior. This could be a reward or a penalty, but this is one of the most important parts of learning. Just like if you think of Pavlov's experiments with uh, dogs like giving treats to reinforce a certain uh, action. It is the same idea. But when we look at uh, the use of reinforcement learning, I find chess as a very good example of explaining reinforcement learning. So when we play chess, there are many possibilities of what would be the next move. And depending on the next move, our next next move is impacted. And depending on the opponent's actions, our, again, uh, new decisions of actions are impacted as well. So as you see on the right-hand side here, uh, there can be many possible policies, but then there is just maybe one or two best policies, which would give us the highest reward. And if you think of chess, this is the winning policy. Now, this is the uh, story part of reinforcement learning. If, you, if we get to the bottom of the math of uh, or formal representation of reinforcement learning, uh, we need to look at the Markov decision processes. Markov decision processes defines S sub T as a state of the agent at time T, A sub T as action taken at time T, and then in the state of S sub T, an action AT is taken, the clock ticks, and the agent receives the reward T plus one, and the state of the agent changes to ST plus one. Now, these are the state action and reward uh, notions that I showed in the previous slide. Now, what we didn't see in the previous slide is the next state probability and the reward probability. Now, for this, I would like you to think of gambling experience. <laughs> uh, not that I'm an expert in this or uh, I, I, I like it too, too much, but uh, I guess we all know how things work. You pull a lever, uh, you get a reward, but not every time you pull the same lever, you get the same reward because obviously um, the institution, uh, the casino would win or would lose uh, every time. So there is a next state probability in things. There's a probability that given that the environment is in state ST, or sorry, the agent is in state ST, it takes the action AT and it will switch to uh, the next state ST plus one with a certain probability. 
Similarly, reward can be probabilistic as well, depending on what kind of problem we are working on. Uh, when in state ST, action AT is taken, reward uh, RT plus one is given to the agent by a probability. Now, there is an episode of actions that's happening in reinforcement learning. So basically multiple trial and error stages. And after that, a policy is obtained. Now, the goal is to obtain the optimal policy. Now, let's define this with a little bit formally. Uh, so um, we have the value of a policy, and this is a numeric value so that we can make a comparison like 5, 10, you know, you just calculate and uh, see which one is bigger when you when we are choosing the optimal policy but then how we, how do we get these numeric numbers these numeric numbers are actually summation of rewards now if we were thinking of a problem with finite horizon it would be simple we could just add up the rewards bluntly and uh, say the expectation is the value of the policy but uh, we may be considering games or problems that involve thousands of steps so does it really make sense to think about a reward that's thousand steps later? Maybe not, you know, I'm just gonna decide on my current action. So forget about that. I mean, not forget about that, <laughs> just give less importance to that, okay? And that's what gamma that you see in this expected reward formulation is doing. Gamma is called the discount factor. It discount, it's a, a value between zero and one. And that's why it discounts the value of the future rewards. So it's like, providing a myopic vision uh, to the agent. Now, so far so good. If we co collect all these expected rewards into formulations, we do some algebra, we get the optimal policy by using Bellman equation. That's ju actually just uh, uh, the button formula uh, is this and the add probability, next state probability, that one. Now, V star, as you see in this formulation, these are the optimal policies. So the current optimal policy, when we are in state ST, is calculated by uh, the action that maximizes the expected reward in T plus one, plus with a discounted value, the summation of the future uh, optimal policies, the values of the future optimal policies, plus with a, a next state probability. Now, the types of problems Bauman was studying, uh, they were uh, optimal control theory problems. And it was uh, basically, there was a model, known model of the uh, system where we knew the uh, state transition, uh, next state probabilities that P over here uh, was known. And we can use dynamic programming to solve such problems. But uh, in our life, it's not that easy. Uh, especially in wireless world, uh, we work on model-free environments. Model-free environment means uh, we don't have the channel model. And actually that's the reason we are using machine learning. If we had the exact model, then we would just nicely put it into formulas and find. Uh, of course, I mean, the information theory is trying to systemize this, it's trying to come up with formulas, channel models, uh, delay models, and things like that, but we don't have the exact formulations. So this, that's why we are looking into data-driven or machine learning techniques, but some machine learning techniques, if they're model-based, they're still hard to apply. So we go for model-free learning. A very famous model-free learning is Q-learning, and Q-learning is like experimentation again, uh, but there is a phase exploration where we experiment heavily. So we take risky actions. And then there is a period, a larger period of time or a high probability to, to do exploitation. So we use those exploration from our previous uh, experiences. Now, so far so good, but to be able to calculate, sorry, let's go back. To be able to calculate these Q values, we need to store the previous Q values in a table. And if we have a large state and action space, which a problem like wireless networks is quite easy to, to go that way. Uh, the problem becomes uh, really very hard to solve. And why? Uh, the state's, uh, state action space grows exponentially. That table, that Q table becomes huge. Another problem is state space is, uh, could be continuous. So with Q learning, we can solve problems when the state space is um, discrete. But for problems that we have a continuous state space, uh, we get a problem. Now, what can we do to solve this? Imagine you have data uh, and you're complaining about the size of your data. What do you do? You fit a curve, right? If your data is nice, 
you put a you you fit a linear curve, you do linear curve, uh, regression, and by just two parameters, you can summarize your whole data. Think about the same thing. You have a huge Q table. You want to summarize the information there. So you basically fit a function there. <laughs> if this is the linear function, you're lucky. Usually it's not. So that's why we need a filter. And neural networks are actually good function representations. So for that reason, uh, we find it advantageous to put deep uh, neural networks, I'm going to say in front of, but I mean, as a driver of reinforcement learning. And of course, I mean, we are not the ones who invented it. Uh, they were invented um, in this architecture that I'm showing with the target deep neural network and experience replay memory by Google Mind researchers. And that was published in uh, 2015 in a Nature article, a very highly cited uh, article. Now, what's happening here is that uh, two important mechanisms that are being integrated with reinforcement learning. A target deep neural network, as you see here, where the main network values are copied at some intervals to in, uh, enable stability. And again, to enable stability, uh, have an experience replay memory, a mini batch of the experiences where the states and the rewards will be, uh, states and the actions will be drawn from. And the fundamental goal is, as any learning, minimizing the loss function. Now, we talked about reinforcement learning. We talked about uh, deep reinforcement learning. Uh, now, a few words about transfer learning and transfer reinforcement learning, because that, those are the techniques that uh, I will also uh, show you how, you how we apply in wireless networks. Uh, so the idea of transfer learning is actually quite intuitive. As humans, we don't learn everything from scratch. We get an experience. We use that experience in our future tasks. Just like that, people working on supervised learning, they said, you know, we have a data set. We are learning some features. We take a second data set. We start learning <laughs> the features from scratch, which doesn't make sense. Why don't we, if we can, do some knowledge transfer, basically call this transfer learning, uh, and have a simpler way of uh, learning the second data set. Now, uh, when it comes to transfer learning, this is mostly uh, the term, term that we use for supervised learning. But the technique that I will focus on and I will show a bit later is transfer reinforcement learning. It's slightly different, but um, philosophically, I would say the idea is the same. We don't learn from scratch. We learn from the experts, but the type of learning is a bit different. And if we want to summarize, I won't go through this table. It's quite <clears throat> detailed and um, it's, it's in one of our very recent papers. We did a comparison or an explanation of reinforcement learning, transfer learning, deep reinforcement learning, and transfer reinforcement learning, because we saw that from time to time they're really confused a lot. So um, there needs to be some uh, explanations. And the nice part is we were able to explain transfer learning and transfer reinforcement learning, which was uh, kind of a blurry area uh, in, the, in the literature. Now, transfer reinforcement learning comes from the literature of robotics. So in robotics, people have applied, invented, or applied these techniques uh, to robot learning. And the idea comes from a robot picking up a mug and a robot, let's say, picking up a pencil. The act of picking up an object is the same thing, but the objects are different. So there are some calibrations. Maybe you, know, you hold the mug like this, the pen like this. Uh, there are some calibration that, calibrations that needs to be done, but essentially, even as a human, like you move your hand like this, you reach out, you grab, some tasks are actually transferable from one uh, case to the other. So that's what we use in our techniques. Now, uh, I guess that much machine learning is enough. Uh, I will get back to these as I show how they are applied, but now let's talk about wireless because this talk is about 5G and 6G. Now, why do we need AI in uh, 5G, beyond 5G and 6G? Now, the need comes from increasing complexity. One reason of this complexity is that uh, our applications are always spectrum hungry. Spectrum is limited. Uh, so very recently, in the past maybe five uh, years, we made advances to be able to use millimeter wave spectrum. 
But millimeter wave spectrum comes with some challenges. Uh, waves cannot propagate to longer distances. And for that reason, we have to use directional antennas and do uh, beamforming. Now, this creates a complexity on its own. So number of, first of all, small ranges, you need more base stations for coverage. Uh, directionality, you need more sectors to cover an area. Uh, and then we see with the massive um, communications, we have massive number of devices connected to 5G and the future uh, generations. We talk about massive MIMO as an additional challenge to millimeter wave. I mean, <laughs> it's an additional, of course, a good feature to boost capacity, but how you manage the network becomes challenging. Uh, and then on top of that, uh, mobile edge computing infrastructure that comes as a help to IoT or vehicular uh, communications where more computations can be offloaded. But again, this comes with some you know, optimization needs and complexities. And then virtualized RANs and finally, uh, ORAN or open RANs uh, that uh, promote multi-vendorness uh, all, uh, all bring the level of complexity at a higher degree. And finally, network slicing is known to be a very complex thing for, uh, to do between cross domains. And uh, for a long time, there has been talks about closed loop automation or closing the loop and all those things. Uh, so basically no human intervention, uh, but I, I like to think it as human, still human assisted systems because it is more realistic, uh, but we call them AI enabled wireless networks. And in our uh, 2019 work, we made a summary of these uh, techniques, what can be done, you know, what, uh, how these reinforcement learning deep can be applied to wireless networks. And in later years, uh, my group, start, my group uh, continued working on, on these techniques. And in the remaining part of the talk, I will focus on, on these things. The techniques that we developed by using reinforcement learning, deep reinforcement learning, and transfer reinforcement learning. And in, if time allows, I'm going to talk about a very interesting new technique that, uh, that we came up with. Um, so yes, let's start with this work from 2020. And let me check my time. And I, I, <laughs> uh, Rat or Pratip, if I'm going over time, please uh, tell me. For now, it seems OK. <laughs> but when the time comes, uh, feel free to you know, interrupt. Yeah, I think you are. Um, uh, the timing is good. Probably, you know, maybe uh, you know, I, I will ask a question here. If oh, that please, is okay. go yeah. So you, uh, it seems like you are going to talk about you know um, using um, RL machine learning to do some um, base station function, RAND functions. Uh, are you also going to talk about or touch uh, the AI native um, 6G? You know, something that you uh, st talked about it at the beginning. Are you also going to talk about it or? Mm-hmm, mm -hmm. okay, uh, Well, uh, my group focuses on uh, mostly radio resource uh, management, uh, and we work on uh, beam management part of it, uh, but uh, AI native is a very, very large concept. It goes from uh, cross layers, from multiple layers. At the very low layers, uh, we don't work on, on this area, uh, but most of our work focuses on um, radio resource allocation, uh, beam management, uh, exact coordination, caching and computation resource allocation. So resource allocation problems will be the main, main part of the talk. And if, if you want to call it AI enabled or AI native, for me, it's not really quite uh, a difference. <laughs> Okay, all right, okay. <laughs> That's probably how, you know, uh, people come up with cool terms and AI native, yeah, it's a cool world. That's why I used it at the, at the beginning. Uh, but okay. for my research chair at the time when I was deciding 2017, 18, uh, I said, let's call it AI enabled. So <laughs> in, in the papers, we usually call it that way because of, of the chair. I hope this answers your question. Eh? Yes, thank you. <laughs> All right, thank you. And you know, if, if anybody has questions, please uh, feel free to interrupt or write it in the chat and I guess uh, it will be moderated. Okay, let's continue with um, how we use those exciting machine learning techniques. And they're, they're really exciting to me. <laughs> you know, when, I, when I think of those, um, I feel like, yes, you know, 
uh, we are approaching to maybe the levels of, I mean, levels of human intelligence, of course, is quite di difficult, uh, but at least as Jan Lacun says, maybe cat intelligence, <laughs> but we'll see, time will show. Uh, so yeah, uh, in, in our work that we presented in Globcom, uh, we use two different types of machine learning algorithms. One is dbscan, which is an unsupervised machine learning technique that is used for clustering data. And in our case, we used it for clustering mobile users. Uh, and then as we cluster uh, users under certain themes, we looked into how we do radio resource allocation. And for that, we used, um, I won't get much into the details of this, uh, of this work particularly, uh, but uh, if you're interested, you know, please uh, go through the paper and you can, you know, uh, email me for questions. But just for the sake of, you know, completing the discussions, let me describe you a little bit how we do deep reinforcement learning. Uh, there are many ways that you can do resource allocation, but uh, here the decision about uh, choosing simplicity is very important. So the number of states and actions uh, determine how complex your problem will be. Most of the times when we work for reinforcement learning, when we develop reinforcement learning or for deep reinforcement learning techniques, we limit it to the available feedback from the environment. And as you see in this picture, it's most of the time CQI. That's the channel quality index. In another word, words, it's uh, SINR values. So SINR collected from the users comes as a feedback to our deep reinforcement learning agent. Uh, the states could be actually a lot of things, uh, but out of these, uh, we usually try to keep it simple, as I said before, and it's uh, most of the time whether an SINR threshold is satisfied or not. So a user is in state status good if SINR is above a certain threshold, the user is in status bad if the SINR is under a certain threshold. And the aim of the reinforcement learning agent is to drive or reinforce all the users to that uh, successful SINR regime. Now, for this, you need to have a reward. Reward design is an important part of uh, reinforcement learning, and it is one of the most engaging parts of, uh, I would say, um, of, uh, of the techniques that, that we develop and other groups around the world uh, develop. So you have to find a proper reward. Um, and that comes uh, from the optimization objective of, of your system. What do you want to maximize or minimize? Usually we want to maximize the throughput and minimize the latency, but these are conflicting uh, objectives. So you have to find a compromise in between. Or oh, it could be also energy efficiency as well. In some problems, we tackle energy efficiency and we put that in the reward as well. But all in all, these are the things, the, the design considerations that, that we care about. For DB scan, uh, the second uh, machine or the first machine learning technique that I mentioned, um, the, the beauty of DB scan comes from the fact that uh, different than k-means, another very famous unsupervised uh, clustering technique, uh, it can cluster users that, uh, or, or it can identify noise, it can, it can help identify noisy data, and in our case, uh, noisy or outlier uh, users. So how it works is that if you put something or in comparison to k-means, uh, if you apply k-means to certain data, data has to fit into a cluster because there are a certain number of clusters. Uh, whatever happens, you have to fit them in, into those boxes. DB scan is not like that. It puts it in the density. And as the density grows, you can grow the structure of your cluster uh, in an amorphic way. So it doesn't have to be like a box or a, some geometric shape, but it can be much more amorphous than that. And then uh, at the end, you can have outliers that don't fit in any of these uh, densities available. So with this actually, um, and this is more or less describing what I said before, uh, we were able to reduce the latency of your LSE users and also increase the throughput EMBB users. As you might imagine, uh, doing a lot of things at the same time in a wireless network is not easy because usually objectives are contradictory. So once you're improving something in the network, you're actually not doing so well on the other side. So we have to look at the right parameters, right KPIs. What do you want for a ULSC user? ULSC is um, 
ultra reliable low latency communication users and EMBB is the enhanced mobile broadband. Uh, so for your LNC, you want low latency. For EMBB, you want high throughput. So for those, uh, we checked. And we showed that with our technique, uh, in comparison to uh, a K-means-based clustering technique with a priority-based proportional care uh, resource allocation technique, especially uh, for uh, high load regimes, which you see in the um, bottom left-hand side uh, plot, uh, our technique uh, is, is quite superior. Even for low load, low load regime, we have good performance, but under high loads, uh, we show good performance. Same for throughput for EMBB and also some rate of your LSC that we can improve uh, with our technique. Now, what is the, uh, the caveat here? What is the problem here? Uh, the thing is, or the trick is that uh, it takes long time for these techniques to converge. So, what you need to think is uh, we would have a trained model. We put it in the field and we expect that things won't change too much and that would be applicable. Now, this might be a possibility, but most of the time that doesn't hold as well. So in my group, we were not very satisfied. I mean, okay, that's good. We're improving the performance fine, but we're not solving all the problems. So let's revisit that idea. What if, what if we were able to transfer some knowledge from a previous base station, like a base station that learns somewhere else, either offline or another base station that has been deployed before, and we do transfer learning. So by that, our ideas into transfer learning uh, mature. But before I talk about that, uh, since I also said, you know, Q-learning could be a useful technique, uh, in one of the techniques that, that we worked, and that's actually a quite um, good results uh, that we obtained, uh, we looked at a very state-of-the-art problem, carrier aggregation in 5G. Uh, this is a technique that is used to boost user capacity. We have certain carriers, we bundle them up together, and then uh, we give them to a user. And that user, if, this, if they are, for instance, uh, having a long file transfer, a, a, a heavy file transfer, uh, that will be useful to them. Now, um, so far, so good. <laughs> What's bad? You always have to ask, okay, it's good, but there has to be something bad, right? Uh, what happens is that uh, UEs spend energy for monitoring those channels. So for every carrier uh, component carrier CC that is being activated by the carrier aggregation algorithm, uh, UE user has to, model, uh, has to monitor the control channel. And monitoring the control channel has a cost, has an energy cost. And we all know that batteries drain fast. And when you do a high, high uh, file transfer, um, it drains faster. So we said, what can we do about it? Now, allocating the right amount of resources, the right amount of component carriers is the key here. And we developed a Q-learning algorithm, which adapts with the file size and the user demands, user uh, quality of service demands, that gives the, uh, I don't want to say exact, but uh, that gives optimal amount of carriers to that user. So rather than giving, let's say, three uh, component carriers are available in a system or five component carriers are available, rather than giving them all at once or just giving a primary component carrier, which would you know, uh, decrease the capacity quite um, severely, we find that middle ground. And we show that some throughput is good. We show that latency is good and number of active CCs are low. Therefore, UE energy consumption is, is low. Now I will continue um, with transfer sorry. reinforcement learning, but if, yeah, if you have any questions, I can take them. Um, there, were, there were a couple of questions. So I was thinking to interrupt, sorry. Um, one is, you know, are you using uh, synthetic data or some realistic data set in you know, one? Uh, other question is, you know, how many hidden layers are there? And also a related question, um, the effects of the multipath mitigation. If you can comment on those, you know, that'd be great. Yes, um, I should say my memory is not so good. So I might not remember all the questions in the order, but let's go one by one. Uh, and if I miss anything. Um, yeah, I will remind, you know, <laughs> let's talk about synthetic data versus real, realistic data. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I, I get this question a lot. And um, the way that reinforcement learning works is by instant feedback. 
So we don't work on a data set, but rather we work on a simulator where, where we get the instant feedback, the CQI value of the users, and then adjust our algorithms. So that's why we don't work on synthetic data or real data. We work on simulators. Okay, all right. Um, and the, the number of neural networks, that's a, <laughs> that number of layers in a neural network, that's a difficult question because that varies from one scheme to the other. Uh, yeah. We optimize it. We, the tuning of the hyperparameters of the neural network, including the layers, the functions, activations, functions, optimizer we use, could be different from one technique to the other because it is highly um, problem dependent. So if, you know, somebody's interested in one technique, then... I suggest they go through the paper, and if we haven't provided the details there, then they can contact us. That would okay. be the All right. exact That's answer. Good. That's clear. Uh, the other other question was, you know, uh, how are the effects of multipath mitigated? Mm -hmm. um, well, um, how are the effects of multipath mitigated? Uh, well. Maybe the best way to answer this question is we consider the multipath effects, uh, but uh, we don't do anything particular to mitigate it. Uh, basically, through our simulators, we use as much as possible realistic channel models, including uh, their non-line of sight, fading, shadowing, multipath, but again, as much as possible because we're talking about the uh, simulator in the end. Uh, and then... Uh, with this, we are taking multipath into consideration, but we are not doing anything to mitigate it. Okay, all right. Uh, well, there was another question came in. Let me also read that question. So are you using a single agent or multi-agent? In case if you use multi-agent, uh, how you manage the information sharing during the training procedure? Oh, that's a very good question. <laughs> uh, well, should I give a spoiler or no? <laughs> well, the techniques that I've been talking about up to now, they consider uh, individual agents. So even though we might have multiple base stations, uh, they're all modeled as single agent systems. And it is true, they may have uh, some interactions between them that we do not model. Uh, I guess the question uh, you know, uh, also is asking that. Uh, and then there is a family of techniques that apply to multi-agent techniques that we also work on, uh, but I haven't started talking about those. And the interactions between the agents could be really interesting. And we recently published, uh, well, actually, it is going to be presented in ICC in the coming weeks. Uh, it's a team learning technique. It's at the very end of this presentation. So I will just delay answering this question a bit. And then if uh, there's a more detailed question on multi-agent systems, I will answer over there. All right, that makes sense. Uh, we will wait for that, you know, at the end. <laughs> so that, that's a good way. So you're going to, to you're going to, you're going to present part of your ICC paper here. <laughs> yes. <laughs> well, we have it on archive anyway, so. <laughs> okay. But yeah, that's that's like a pre-release, and you know, <laughs> I'll keep the audience hopefully till the end. <laughs> okay. So let's get started with transfer reinforcement learning. Um, we published this work in 2021, and. Uh, we are actually the first group uh, to, to, to propose uh, transfer reinforcement learning in 5G systems for wireless network optimization. Uh, and soon after or simultaneously, we saw some papers coming out, but uh, this is a very, very uh, recent and hot research area. Uh, and in our paper, what we did, what we particularly focused at was, uh, we said, okay, you know, learning takes time. Uh, it's, it's very uh, high cost to have learners to learn everything from scratch. Plus, it's not how humans learn or animals learn. So why don't we have some expert genome bees learn something, and then learner genome bees on the field being trained or by transferring information from expert genome bees, performing actions, learning actions, much faster. So in terms of what they optimize in the network, they have to have some similarities. Basically, you cannot transfer every information. 
but I mean, that's, I guess, intuitive, right? I mean, uh, as in our learning as a, as a human, we cannot transfer every information from one field to the other. So fields have to be related, just like that. So we said, let's, let's look at a small problem. Uh, let's look at, uh, let's say experts are learning user cell association uh, in a low band scenario where we have omnidirectional cells. Uh, and for learners, they are working on millimeter waves, so they're highly directional, and they're looking at joint user cell association and deciding the number of beams. Uh, and we implemented the learners, we implemented the experts with Q-learning and implemented the learners with transfer Q-learning. At the end, we saw that, uh, so the, on the right-hand side, uh, sorry, on the left-hand side, we're looking at the uh, convergence of expert genome B, and on the right-hand side, we're looking at the learner genome B. Uh, first of all, we see that expert genome B converges, but it takes some time. For the learner genome B, we can reduce this time. But still, there is room for improvements. I mean, uh, it's not ideal, because if we're talking about um, very uh, short uh, time scales, then uh, there is still some learning uh, to be done in a certain amount of time. So basically, it still comes back to the fact offline, you cannot do everything uh, online. But nevertheless, we were able to show that transfer reinforcement learning could open up the doors for shortening this time. And then we said, uh, you know, why don't we look at other problems? Because one of the things that my group is interested is in RAN slicing. Uh, so you know that um, for slicing, transport slicing is a solved problem. Uh, we have commercial products there, but edge slicing, RAN slicing are uh, challenging areas. Uh, so for that purpose, we developed uh, a transfer reinforcement learning based or, or knowledge, that's what we call knowledge transfer based uh, resource allocation in, in RAN slicing. And we presented this work in CCNC the beginning of this year. So this is a two step method. The first step is resource allocation, uh, inter slice, and then the second one resource allocation in intra slice. So we said, first, let's split the resources between URLSC and the MBB, and then under URLSC slice, let's give the resources to URLSC users in some uh, allocation way, and then do another allocation for EMBB users. Now, um, we have, as I said, two slices, EMBB and uh, URLSC, and their goals are what? EMBB slice wants to maximize the throughput, URLSC slice requires low latency. So its aim is uh, to uh, reduce its uh, latency. Now, we applied re transfer reinforcement learning technique here, and we have two phases in this technique. And it is, I think, best uh, shown, I mean, we, we, on the left-hand side, we're looking at the optimization problem, but we don't implement and solve the optimization problem. It is the formal representation of the transfer reinforcement learning, where, as I said, you know, one of the objectives is maximizing the throughput, the first term. The second one is minimizing the latency under the constraints of average latency, average uh, sorry, average throughput, average latency, uh, and resource allocations and capacity constraints. But if you look at the figure on the very, very right-hand side, then that actually gives a good idea of transfer reinforcement learning. So we have to start from the uh, bottom part. We have the expert at the bottom. Expert is being trained, so it's taking a certain action and taxes and a task is impacted, sorry, uh, and the expert agent uh, receives a reward. After a certain uh, training period, there is knowledge transfer that is denoted by the orange box here. So the knowledge transfer box goes into the learner agent along with its own reinforcement learning approach. And because the, um, the information when you do uh, resource allocation for slices is quite closely related, transferring knowledge is, uh, is relatively easy, I would say. So it's uh, like you are transferring information or you're transferring uh, knowledge from a very similar task to the other one. And with this, we were able to show that, now uh, we can look at the results, we were able to show that, uh, let's start with the plot on the right-hand side at the bottom, uh, the transfer learning technique or knowledge transfer KTRA, uh, that's the new technique, the green line, uh, and Q learning is the red line. Uh, the convergence of the uh, knowledge transfer technique 
is much faster than the pure learning technique. And if you look at the latency results, because we are talking about the two slices, I had the throughput results, but I did not bring, they were as well good as you can imagine. Uh, and if interested, you know, one can find in the paper. Uh, but just uh, even if we just look at the latency, we can see that the green line, the knowledge transfer technique has the lowest latency. Uh, Q-learning has a bit higher latency, but the expert itself had the uh, highest latency. So by taking actions, and on the left-hand side, you look at this, how a source task, a target task is mapped. By mapping a source task to a target task, we're able to learn better than the expert and receive uh, lower latency. We had similar results for throughput for EMDB slice as well. Now, um, now let's talk about uh, multi-agent systems and a new technique that we proposed in ICC that excites us a lot. And it's called team learning. Uh, and it is, well, let me see how much time we have. <laughs> Not much time. So um, I, will, uh, I won't go too much into the details of Oran, but some of you might be familiar. This is a new, uh, New, yeah. Uh, um, regarding time, you know, actually we um, uh, schedule, you know, schedule this one from five to six thirty. Usually we finish in one hour, and then you know some more questions comes in. So don't worry about the timing. You know, if, you know this is really good material. You know, uh, take your pace, and you know, uh, uh, yeah, don't worry great. too much. Thank you. <laughs> okay. Wonderful. Um, yeah. So. Um, in the, in the last how many years? <laughs> Maybe four or five years. So it still has history, but time flies. <laughs> uh, with the emergence of Oran Alliance, uh, which promotes openness and multi-vendorness of, uh, of the RAN architecture, uh, we have seen an interest in uh, two new architectural components in the network. One is called non-real-time RIC, and the other one is called near-real-time RIC. And the um, network applications that are deployed at the non-real-time RIC are called RFs. And the network functions that are deployed at the near-real-time RIC are called as XFs. The difference between RFs and XFs are the time scales. So we talk about close to millisecond, that's why it's near real time, uh, time scales when it comes to near real time, but seconds, minutes, hours for the non-real time. Now, um, Oran, I said, like Oran promotes multi vendorness disaggregation of the network, and all those things. And this comes with uh, a possibility that multiple vendors might be developing uh, X apps that can that may need to interact with each other, or in another words, that may be turning the knobs of the network, optimizing some things, but that they might be optimizing conflicting parameters. So I said, how do we solve this? How do we look at this problem in terms of like, imagine XAPs are a team and they are, you know, fighting, <laughs> trying to get some goal uh, achieved. So how, how would we handle those conflicts between those XAPs? Um, now, first of all, we have to think about what is the opposite, right? Let, let's look at the traditional case. We have multiple agents that are, one is driving the uh, XAP A, another one is driving XAP B, and we don't have team learning. They are all doing, uh, both doing their own job by using uh, deep reinforcement learning, for example. They could use something else, but just as an example. So what happens here is that um, both of these XAPs are changing parameters of the same environment, and they are receiving some reward from the environments. A uh, couple of issues here. Things may be, may be out of sync. So um, earlier than the other, which may uh, result in different decisions than it should for, uh, for let's say, XFB. Uh, also, they might be trying to change uh, interrelated parameters. As we know, there are lots of uh, knobs in the network that might, uh, if you change one, that will influence the other one. So without team learning, uh, there is this risk of uh, environments being changed by multiple agents without knowing what changes have been done. Now, uh, we came up with a team learning uh, technique 
which is actually, um, I would say, um, it has room for improvement because it is particularly done for uh, two agents. We have upcoming research to uh, scale it up to multiple uh, multiple agents, more than two agents, uh, but this is not uh, published right now. Uh, if you look at just two agents, how we do team learning is uh, we do it in a sequential way. So we take XAP A first. XAP A, sorry, XAP A decides on a certain action does not implement the action, but tells this action of what action it will take to XAP B. XAP B executes its, its deep reinforcement learning technique by using information from uh, XAP A, and that information is action A1, as seen here, and takes an action. So the action of XAP B is stabilized. It has made its decision by looking at the action of uh, XAP A. Now, the time is now to return back the action of uh, XAP B, which we call as action B. This is returned to XAP B, XAP A, I'm sorry, <laughs> it's a bit confusing to explain, but uh, anyways, XAP A. <clears throat> XAP A runs its own deep, deep reinforcement learning algorithm by using this extra information and decides on its actual action, which is as seen in this figure, action A2. So action A1 is an auxiliary action, it does not, uh, it is not implemented over the environment. It is like a pre-decision that will influence the decision of XAP-B. XAP-B finalizes the decision and then gives that decision or tells that decision to XAP-A to finalize the decision of XAP-A. So obviously this slows down things a little bit, but if you, if we want, um, if you want the agents to behave conflict-free and perform well, we needed such a mechanism. And we showed it with some independent learning and team learning uh, comparison. So we said if these um, agents, if these two agents were independently learning, what would their learning performance be? We see it in the uh, left-hand side plot. We see that with team learning, more rewards, system throughput is how we formalized the, uh, formulated the reward. So that's why it's uh, given as a convergence curve. Uh, we see that the blue line, which is the team learning line is higher. So we can achieve higher throughput uh, in terms of one trial, episode by episode. And if you look at different varying uh, traffic loads, we see that under varying traffic loads, still the uh, team learning is performing better than the independent learning technique. And in terms of convergence, uh, like it converges. To, uh, so uh, basically we were uh, able to show that uh, team learning had a better performance than independent learning, both in terms of how much time it converges, also how much higher uh, convergence it gets, how much higher reward it gets. Uh, as you see, blue curve, like above the red curve in the left-hand side uh, plot, episode by episode. Uh, and then if you look at different traffic loads, under different traffic loads, what happens, which is on the right-hand side, um, we showed that, again, uh, TDL, team learning, performs better than uh, independent learning. Now, um, I will wrap up my talk by uh, saying that we are in the spring for uh, AI. So it's the AI spring. I don't call it AI summer. And this refers back to the, maybe if you're familiar in uh, AI, um, uh, AI history, there are famous uh, AI winters where you know there were funding cuts, people stopped doing research. Uh, it was not a good uh, you know area to do to do work on because you know there was a hype and then people found out that uh, AI techniques were not performing so well. So we had the AI um, AI winters, and then uh, we ask ourselves: Are we there yet? Do we have enough maturity in AI techniques? Uh, I'm a little bit cautious there. I'd like to call it AI spring. It's just before the summer. Uh, but I'm quite hopeful that uh, summer will come for, for AI techniques applied to 5G and 6G. And the reason is that um, for a very long time, we were looking into model-driven uh, provisioning and most of the time doing over-provisioning. By using data, we have more opportunities. Uh, we see that networks are becoming software-centric. We see that computation is coming closer to the edge. 
and we see that there is disaggregation at the front hall. So we have more opportunities or, of employing AI and benefit uh, from AI. Uh, I've added federated learning here as well. It is, um, it's an interesting technique. Uh, I wish we had more time, another hour maybe, to talk about federated learning as well. Uh, but I mean, all these newly emerging uh, machine learning techniques from many areas, not just you know wireless networks, computer vision, uh, natural language processing, robotics. Uh, we can successfully apply them to to networks, and I see that you know as we progress in this uh, area, as we reach maturity, uh, we will see the real benefits of AI. And having said that, uh, of course, there are some challenges. Um, we have convergence challenges. As, as I've shown, convergence times are not short. Uh, these have to be shortened or some offline training has to be integrated. Scalability, uh, usually in simulations, we think about one, two you know, base stations, maybe limited number of users, but this has to go to a higher scale as well. Uh, then for the data sets for um, techniques that use data, we don't have standardized uh, training sets. And for simulators, we can say the same thing. We don't have standardized uh, simulators. So a little bit immaturity in terms of uh, how natural language processing or computer techniques are advancing. We are still taking our uh, early steps. And then multiple agents or distributed agents, those techniques are complicated. And then um, how do we learn from rare events? If we are talking about fault, uh, prediction, if you are talking about you know, healing, things like that. Uh, those are the events that luckily don't happen too often. <laughs> but then how do you learn from things that don't happen too often? That's a known challenge in machine learning as well. All right, with this, uh, I want to conclude my talk. Of course, as usual, uh, I thank my students because it's, uh, it's their effort. Uh, blood, sweat, and tears over years during PhD and master and postdoc studies that they make this uh, research possible. And also uh, funding agencies that support my lab and serve, of course, with Canada Research Chair and multiple funds, NSF from United States, uh, MITAX and UNCOR program of Ontario Centers of Excellence. Uh, they have been uh, funders of my lab uh, in, uh, in the past many years. So we are all very uh, appreciative of their uh, support. And finally, uh, if you want to see more talks, you can subscribe to my YouTube channel as many of us say these days. Uh, and I believe this talk will be also uh, published on YouTube maybe, I don't know, but it's been recorded. Uh, so I will create a link uh, to this talk if, if that is made as well. And if you have any further questions, like you can ask questions of course now, but if uh, we don't have time to answer all of them, uh, please feel free to send me an email. All right. Thank you so much for the wonderful talk, uh, Mel. It's really good. Um, I We have a, 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 couple, a few questions there. You know, I can go to those questions. I also have another question as well. Um, you know, the simple question is, you know, uh, would, uh, can you make these slides available to the audience? Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Okay. All right. Yeah, you can send it to me and then I can, uh, say, you know, we can put it in a, a SharePoint so that you know, others can get it. Okay, thank you for that. Um, there was another question on, how do you transfer knowledge, um, sharing neural network weights uh, for a short uh, sort of model uh, aggregation uh, and um, averaging the weights of different neural networks or sharing the optimal uh, action state pairs? Uh, yeah, that, 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 that's a good question. Uh, we have, um, well, let me remember because, um, yeah, we do, we do several uh, transfer learning techniques. And the one I presented here, um, it, is, um, it works more like the first one, sharing the neural network weights, but more like um, transferring the Q values. So yeah, transferring uh, neural network and uh, Q values. For the actions, not state actually, action transfer, we, we also do action transfer, but this work I did not describe in this talk. But yeah, both are possible. We don't do state uh, transfer though. All right, thank you. Um, somebody asking, you know, 
can can I ask uh, can we ask questions live? Yes, please. You know, please unmute and ask your question. And there was another question. Let me read. Why is the network security not in the list of outstanding challenges? Mm -hmm. uh, it's probably because I'm not an expert in the area. <laughs> but definitely, it's a challenge, and AI can be a good tool to solve that as well. But I'm expecting other researchers to handle this because uh, there's already so much exciting problems in this domain that we are addressing. Now, I wanted to ask a question on the ICC paper. So you have the um, the group learning kind of thing. So you know, I wanted to see how feasible that is. You know, in a multi-vendor accepts, you know, kind of interactions and things. You know, how do you see the feasibility of having that? Can you ask the beginning of your question because I'm. Oh, I'm sorry. Yeah, like you know, the the accepts. Uh, the the group based learning something. I forget the exact uh, team movie. learning. Yeah, team learning. Team learning. Uh, for that, you know, you have some uh, interaction between those uh, two XAPs, right? So these mm -hmm. are, you know, potentially multi-vendor, different vendors have different XAPs. So how these can become uh, feasible uh, in, a, in a realistic environment? Mm -hmm. Excellent question. Uh, <laughs> uh, yes, that can be a problem. <laughs> uh, <laughs> but still, yeah, it, it's possible, but there are challenges in there. Okay. Yeah, I mean, either... Um, to optimize the performance, uh, they need to agree on information right. sharing. Right. Uh, or the other way is uh, our new techniques that we haven't published yet. <laughs> okay. <laughs> so teaser for more talks. Eh? <laughs> hey, Ross, this is Randy. It's 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 kind of interesting, and thank you. Um, this is a great talk. Um, as an aside, the AIRC Standards Association. The committee is looking exactly at that as a potential opportunity in terms of AI-based standards. So more to come on that in the coming months. Um, but like a, to your, specific to your point is, so the RFE, the radio front end, is going to be always transmitting. Um, and I did an experiment a year ago where I took six cell phones, had them running with their with their ASIC utilization greater than 85%, and the battery life ran about 42 minutes. So if I look at overall power consumption, this is this is trivial in a sense of, of what's happening. Plus, as we heard last week at the at the wireless connectivity and conference, is there's going to be many, many elements for MIMO applications. So now the RFP is running at 100 percent, which is where most of the power is going. So I'm trying to understand where where the AI benefits truly come in. Um, in terms of overall performance, especially if you're sitting right at the edge between two base stations, um, not to mention the multipath, there's there's huge conflicts and handoffs. And so does, does AI, perhaps not the power, but maybe the latency, can you elaborate possibly? Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Uh, that, that, that's a good one. And that's something I did not talk too much about, but um, you know, if we had more time, I think if, I would have included more on that. Uh, energy efficiency is one very uh, important aspect of things. Most of the results I showed that we focus on throughput and latency, but as a matter of fact, we have works on energy efficiency as well. And that's a very challenging problem, as you mentioned, and it is becoming uh, a big challenge uh, with the advancing technology. Uh, I see that AI can play a great role there as well. Um, of course, well, just uh, maybe a couple of weeks ago, uh, I gave a talk about um, how can AI help uh, energy efficiency and the energy efficiency of AI techniques. Now emerges the idea of whether running AI uh, is energy efficient after all. Like, yes, we can use AI for optimizations, but then you spend so much energy maybe for AI. And um, over there, actually, um, the, when I was, um, uh, you know, doing some reading for, for that talk, uh, in the AI community, I saw actually great advances that has happened uh, in the past few years, especially from the Google group, uh, that um, increased the energy efficiency of AI techniques themselves. So um, we, we don't, I mean, uh, 
I guess wireless networks is a small portion, I would say, of the AI community. And it's actually a very, very small portion. If you look at the other uh, areas that, like natural language processing, computer vision, and people have observed it before us, like the um, energy consumption of AI techniques being high. Uh, and this is now being addressed. I'm very happy to see that. So I'm hopeful that uh, you know, we will reach to a point where the edge AI techniques won't be too much energy consuming, plus they are helping the network to consume energy. So it's like the two sides of the coin. I'm not sure if that answered your question exactly, but yeah. Thank you. It, it, it helped fill in uh, some additional, so thank you. Mm -hmm. And I can follow up on offline with the other stuff. Absolutely. Right. Any other questions? Anybody have? All right. If not, you know, I have one, you know, quick uh, question. You know, at the beginning, you showed, you know, 6G, you know, AI native, AI native as well as, you know, semantic. Uh, you did not talk anything much about semantics. So are you also working in that area? <laughs> um, I, I think that's... Um... That's a very important area uh, that will uh, pick up. I, I see its maturity. I mean, it's, it's debatable, I guess, but my opinion is that when we look at the um, AI native or AI enabled techniques, they are relatively more mature than semantics. Semantics right. is, a, is a quite new area. We have looked into that in, in one of our papers. Uh, but um, we did not pursue it so much uh, because, uh, I mean, it, it was not, I wouldn't say it's not, it's, it wasn't too much of a technical uh, decision. So I, I don't want to say like we didn't see a lot of benefits or stuff like that. Uh, we could have seen, but uh, I think it still needs to mature. Yeah. Uh, we need more research in that area, but that definitely is an exciting area. All right. Okay. Um, so if there's no other questions, let's uh, thank our uh, speaker. Uh, maybe you can use the, the <laughs> uh, reaction button. Uh, thank you very much. Um, well, I uh, thank you very much for your invitation and for hosting my talk. It's been a great pleasure. Yeah, probably we will bring you uh, again for Federated Learning sometime. <laughs> <laughs> would be lovely yeah okay all right um pradeep do you have anything to say uh, no i i i don't i think uh, thank you all uh, from the uh, from the different comsat groups that uh, joined today and um, we hope you enjoyed the event and have a good evening thank you all uh, from the uh, from the different comsat groups that uh, joined today and um, we hope you enjoyed the event and have a good evening all right thank you have a good evening Thank you very much, everyone, for participating. Have a good evening. Okay, bye.